aff closely affiliated with. And I see a lot of CGD, MCUBE, and RAL here today. And maybe let's have the second question, which is, which option best describes your career stage? Is that directed to anybody specific? Whoever's here can answer. Yeah, we just want to get an understanding of who our audience is, and that would make it easier uh, for the speakers to know who they're speaking with, and then for us to know who's engaged in the conversations. Excellent. Thank you. Sure. Well, I see mostly postdocs, but we do have a, a range of early career scientists here. So I would just want to make sure that uh, David, John Gagne, and Julie Demuth, you're, we can hear you. If you could just say hi. hi. OK, we hear you. Hey. <laughs> That's great. And presumably, you can hear me, too, if you can hear DJ. Yes. Oh, you're in the room. That's great. I, I didn't know that you were there. Awesome. I just got here like 30 seconds ago. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Well, I think that uh, we can start now. So welcome everyone to the sixth session of the NCAR UCP postdoc grant writing and management series. And this session is going to be focused on convergent science. And we have three speakers that we're really excited about. Julie Demuth, uh, Project Scientist 3 from MCUBE at NCAR. Paulette Blanchard, uh, many roles she plays, I've heard, but one of them that we're familiar with is the PI at NCAR Rising Voices Changing Coast grant, and she is here from Haskell Indian Nations University, and David John Gagne, machine learning scientist too, from Sizzle and RAL at NCAR. Can I have the next slide, Mariana? Thank you. So this uh, series is organized by the Postdoctoral Fellows Professional Development Committee, and today, the moderators are myself, Suda, and then we have Shima Shams, Mariana Keynes, Diamond Tachera, uh, and Anna Del Moral Mendez, and all of us are postdocs here at NCAR. And I'll give a chance for our speakers to introduce themselves better, but I just wanted to give you the series schedule. It was a six session series, and as you can see, we're on the final and sixth session, which focuses on convergent science. If you've missed any of the previous sessions, we do have the recordings and we will share them with you. And uh, the uh, session structure, which is on the next slide, uh, we are going to talk a little bit about the topics and goals and what we would hope to touch on in this session. And then we'll have uh, short presentations from our speakers talking about uh, the work that they do related to convergent science. And then we will have a roundtable discussion moderated by Diamond, Mariana, and Shima. Uh, and then we'll move on to Slido questions moderated by Anna, uh, which will be questions from the audience to the speakers. And we'll finish with closing thoughts from the, uh, from the speakers and also the series organizers. Um, next slide, Mariana. Thank you. So in this session, we're hoping to at least understand what is convergent science because it is a relatively new area to most of us at least. And some of us don't really know what it means, me including myself. So I'm really excited to understand what really convergent science means. I've heard a lot of descriptions. And then also to talk about how we can conduct collaborative writing and ideation when we are all coming from different fields and making sure everyone's uh, ideas and science and skills are valued the same. And then we're going to focus on convergent science to include indigenous knowledge and communities and end with some tips on how to get involved in convergent science as an early career scientist. because. Uh, we might not know how the people, how to network, how to get involved in those projects, and it would be nice to hear from the speakers who've been involved uh, in these projects on how to get involved. And um, without taking more time, I'd like to ask our first speaker, Julie Demuth, to introduce herself and talk about her science related to convergent science. Okay, Hi, great. Julie, welcome. Thank you. Just checking again that you can hear me. Okay, great. So I might have quasi misinterpreted a few things. Um, I will introduce myself, but I've got a couple slides that have definitions that we can quickly go into and maybe cover. I can just give sort of my perspective on this and then if Paulette and DJ have anything they wanna say. 
And then I figured I would talk very briefly about one of my projects, but I really would love there to be more discussion because I feel like talking at you all isn't the best way to learn about this stuff. Um, so I think, well, I guess I will introduce myself first. Um, so like Suda said, I'm a project scientist in M cubed. Um, although actually I started in what was called ISSI at the time, which I don't even remember now what that stands for. Uh, I honestly don't even remember what that stands for. And then also had a joint appointment with Rao. Um, my background is in both atmospheric science where I did my undergrad and my master's degree in atmospheric science. So I was one of those people who grew up completely in love with the weather. And then while I was doing my master's work, I got really interested in sort of the human component of things. And so I kind of had a, you know, career crisis at that point in time, an existential crisis. I was just reflecting on this the other day. It's funny how these things make you reflect on this, but it's true. So I thought I would share that. And it's like, what do I want to do? I don't really know. Um, I ended up going to work for the National Academies, uh, their board on atmospheric sciences and climate for a few years. And then that was actually how I met Eve Gruntfest, who is somebody who, um, thank you, Scott. I'm like, <laughs> I knew society was in there somewhere. I got hung up on the eye. <laughs> I'm like, what does this stand for? Um, uh, so I met Eve Gruntfest, which is somebody who had been doing research kind of in this arena, looking at kind of human behavior in response to the big Thompson flood. And it was really through Eve that I expressed my interest in kind of social science, even though I didn't really know what it stood for at the time or really what it all encompassed. And ended up coming to NCAR and helping stand up a series of workshops called Was Is, Weather and Society Integrated Studies. Happy to talk about that. But while I was doing that work, I had the opportunity to work with uh, Rebecca Morris and Jeff Lazo. And that was when I realized I was really interested enough in this stuff to actually think about getting a PhD. And so I went back and I got a PhD in communication while I was working at NCAR um, and working kind of alongside them. And so really my research kind of sits at that interface of risk communication, risk perception and decision making, um, but also really tied to kind of issues of predictability and like predictive capabilities. Um, so Marianne, if you're, I think Marianne, you're running the slides. Um, if you can go to the next slide. So I just wanted to put up some definitions because I think it's great, Suda, that you said that you're not really sure because this is a term that I think for some of us, we use a lot knowing what we mean by it. But it's even interesting to me to encounter people who are like, I don't really know what you mean. I was talking to somebody very high, high up in weather service this summer and he thought I just invented the term. He's like, oh, that's a nice idea. I was like, that's not mine. <laughs> um, I can tell you what it means. And so I, in particular, really rely on the National Science Foundation definition, which is that if we have kind of these really challenging research problems, kind of these really wicked or particularly vexing issues that are kind of require deep scientific questions or really are often connected to these pressing societal needs, that to address these, we really require this deep integration acro across the different disciplines. And kind of, I love this part here too, that if we're doing this deep integration, we really are kind of blending our knowledge, right? We're bringing our theories, our methods to the table, but we're also thinking a lot about refining our research questions or you know, creating new kinds of research questions or approaches or things that we're really um, doing that are different from if we were doing it kind of solely disciplinarily on our own. And that last part, I also wanted to highlight that you know, these new frameworks or paradigms or even new fields can emerge from when you're really doing convergent science research. But this is one definition. So Marianne, if you can go to the next slide. Um, I wanted to also share this because this is a report that came out, I think last year, yeah, or 2021, on the future of Earth system science for NSF. And this was an academy's report. And I just wanted to highlight in there this box, which actually has definitions of what disciplinary, interdisciplinary, um, transdisciplinary and convergent science are. And you can see my highlights there. And for the most part, it's pretty consistent. I know it's tough to read, but mostly I just wanted to make sure people have this reference. For the most part, it's consistent with NSF's definition. The one thing that you'll see a little bit in here in transdisciplinary and convergence is they also talk about maybe working with communities. So it's not necessarily just researchers who are coming to the table. I think both are valid. Um, and then maybe one more slide, Mariana. I like this, which is Lori Peak. She has led this big effort at the Natural Hazard Center um, called Converge. And they put out a paper in 2020 where she was taking the ideas and particularly applying them to hazards and disasters. So she's got a definition there. It's kind of small again, for the most part, pretty consistent. But I also really like this representation. I have a colleague who doesn't love this because she thinks it's really simplified. But for me, I just feel like it nicely characterizes disciplinary, multidisciplinary, where you can have multiple disciplines at the table, but they're really working in parallel, hardly ever interacting. Interdisciplinary, where they're starting to blend a little bit more, but that kind of transdisciplinarity or convergent science, where you're really getting more of that kind of deep integration idea. 
Um, I will give credit to Rebecca Morse, who says like she would actually like to see that transdisciplinary, like still kind of ordered, right? You know, the colors are all in the same order, like blended even more, like a lot messier than that, because I think that's really what transdisciplinarity <laughs> looks like. Um, so this is one more definition or representation. And then Marianne, if you can go to one more slide, and then I promise I'll talk about one project. I also wanted to share, this is a paper that Rebecca Morris, Heather Lazarus, and I wrote and put in risk analysis a few years ago, where we were talking about, we call it interdisciplinarity, but really we were talking more about convergence and transdisciplinarity. And what does it really look like at the working level? Because there's a lot of conversations around structurally kind of at high levels. How do we, how do we help people, um, you know, be able to succeed in an organization like NCAR? Or how does an individual do this? But we really wanted to dig into what does this look like on a day-to-day -day basis when you're working on projects. And so we wrote about what we think are different strategies for doing this. And I wanted to, and there's like, these are basically the highlights of the sections, like how we do come together. We maybe start with this overarching research question, which is what brings people to the table. But when you're all there in the room, that's when you really start refining and maybe articulating new research questions or changing them in different ways. We talked about different mechanisms and then also like really what this looks like when we're really interconnecting kind of the knowledge and ideas. And we had to synthesize, I think, um, in a couple of different tables, what signs of successful interdisciplinary work looks like and then what are some of the practices so I just wanted to highlight this for people who are interested in that. Um, okay, so those are a few resources and I would love to hear from Paulette and DJ about if they have other things that they would like to bring to the table in terms of definitions. But just to very briefly introduce one project, well, two projects. So this is one project I'm not gonna talk about today, but I am giving an MQ seminar on the latest <laughs> So um, interestingly, and we can get into this if we want to, I would probably call this convergence um, or at least I think it's on the path to convergence. I don't really want to get into like policing what is and isn't, and, but I think there are good conversations to be had about how do we decide, again, what are indicators of convergent projects. Um, I would not say I have the answer. I'd love this to be a conversation, but I am going to talk about this project later this afternoon. But the one that I thought I would just kind of give an example of today, if you can go to the next slide, Mariana, <clears throat> excuse me, is a project that began for me in 2015 when there were model developers over, over in Boulder at the Global Systems Lab who were really interested in developing new convection allowing model ensemble guidance for forecasters. And they wanted to know what is the kind of information that these forecasters actually need? What would be useful? What is actually usable for them? And so they actually, because they knew about Rebecca and me, asked us to participate in this project. It was an R2O funded grant. And under the US Weather Research Program, that's what USWRP stands for there. And I try to take, I think it was Anna's suggestions about like, what was the objective high level? What's the so what and what was our role? Um, so that is the objective. I think the so what really had a couple of components. I mean, first and foremost, that if we could figure out what forecasters need, we could actually design stuff that is more helpful for them to do their jobs, which then functionally should help society. But I also think part of the so what that came out of this, not something I thought about from the outset, is really changing how we approach these kinds of questions, not to be just disciplinary, right? Not just to be the model developers in the room. Um, and so my role on this was as a co-PI, but I was really the social science lead who did all this research with forecasters to learn about what guidance they, they look at, how they might make sense of information, what are some of their key like challenges when they're issuing forecaster warnings, and then how can we derive new guidance or develop new probabilistic guidance for them. But that was a very high level effort. And I wouldn't even have called that convergent, even though so much of what we learned fed back into the developer space. But what it did is it really, and I would actually say for some convergent projects, I'm not sure you can actually achieve convergence in one research grant. This is again, something we can talk about. But it then led to this follow on grant that was funded also by NOAA under what's called the JETI program. And I put these here in case people are interested. And in, you know, this is a proposal writing workshop to think about where you, you could propose to. Um, JTTI stands for Joint Tech Transfer Initiative. And it is also kind of an R2O focused um, program out of NOAA. And this was then a grant that I led. Um, and again, the objective here was kind of similar, but a little bit more focused based off of um, the kinds of things that we were starting to learn in that first proposal, but much more focused around deriving and verifying and visualizing different probabilistic timing guidance. So really predicting the onset or the cessation of different winter and fire weather parameters, again, for forecasters. Um, the so what is really still the same, but in this case now my role was the PI. 
And so I was the one who was leading the team of the, of the model developers and the computer scientists. I should also say that the derivation of this information, but then also really um, programming it into an interface, which is impossible to see there. I'm sorry about that. Um, so that forecasters could actually regularly use this and interrogate this information was a key component. So we had computer scientists who were involved in other social scientists. And then my final slide, and I'll promise I'll stop talking, um, is I actually think that this effort then also built a bit of a framework that we brought into the AI2ES framework. Although here, instead of thinking about numerical weather prediction guidance or, AI, or uh, ensemble based guidance, we're taking this and thinking about it in terms of AI and machine learning and uh, the kind of work that DJ and so many others are doing to derive new AI and machine learning output for forecasters. And the final things I'll say about this, because I think it's important for me to articulate like why I think these projects or the suite of projects are convergent. Again, I think it is we are tackling this compelling problem of how do we leverage the state of the art science in ways that are really useful for forecasters. Obviously required this deep integration um, among the different disciplines. The Jetty project also had practitioners involved like in a research level in a way that I didn't talk about, but I'd be happy to. Um, what I loved about this is that we kind of had this iterative driving, like the first project was more driven by the meteorologist with me involved. And by the time we got to the second one, then I was driving and involving the meteorologist. So I think now actually for AI2ES, we're kind of like all driving. If <laughs> I guess um, we can have an AI car where we're all driving somehow. <laughs> I'm sure that's feasible. Um, and I think kind of akin to what, what I mentioned with that paper, Rebecca and Heather and I wrote, we had these really broad research questions initially. We really had to refine them over time. But I would also say, I think out of all of this, there has been this new framework that has been developed where um, NWP guidance and AI and machine learning is, I think, more thought of as a form of risk information. So therefore it requires, you know, really being co-developed and co-produced with social scientists at the table. And this is true from the outset. And I think kind of structurally things are changing to just have this be the, the way of being versus kind of a novel, you know, having social scientists involved maybe a little bit early on. I think AI2ES is an, is an example of this, but I can also say that the Global Systems Lab here in Boulder has really embraced this and now they're standing up an entire social science program to help them do this a little bit more from the outset. And since my voice has run out, it's clearly a time to stop talking. Oh yeah, one more additional resource. Um, we can come back to this if, if folks are interested, but I really wanted to make sure you all had these resources that you could draw on later if you wanted to. All right, I'll Thanks be done. That introduction, right. Julie, yeah. and all the resources you shared with us and uh, Paulette, welcome. And if you could introduce yourself as well. Akihi Wisi Um, I'm Paulette Blanchard. Uh, I, uh, I am a citizen of the absentee Shawnee tribe of Oklahoma and Kickapoo descent, as well as uh, French and Irish and Scottish and, and Dutch. Um, but I'm a, a citizen of the absentee Shawnee tribe of Oklahoma. Um, I got my associates at, at uh, Seminole State College, my bachelor's at Haskell Indian Nations University, a tribal college. My, I was recruited to the University of Oklahoma and um, did my master's work there in geography and did, um, so I have a, a, a bachelor's in indigenous and American Indian studies and master's in geography with spe uh, specializing in indigenous geography, uh, Native Americans and climate change. And then my PhD was um, in, Indigenous Geography from the University of Kansas. Um, I've kind of always had a little bit of a foot in the in what what is being called convergent science now. Now, um, in my undergraduate, I did a summer internship where um, we were taught how to do scientific writing a little bit and um, help develop a research uh, question and do it, do some do some research and develop a paper out of it and mine was looking at how Oklahoma tribes were dealing with climate change and uh, in the process of trying to find out what tribes thought about climate change or what cl tribes thought about the weather in general there was no data I couldn't find anything nobody had ever interviewed the tribes in Oklahoma really um, and even during the there was no voice during the, in, during the Dust Bowl era, there was no recordings or um, interviews of Indian tribes in Oklahoma of how they experience the Dust Bowl, how they experience and deal with tornadoes and floods and drought. So um, my summer internship question that I asked of how tribes in Oklahoma were dealing with climate change basically came, my answer was that there's not enough data that, that the research needed to be done. So I got this crazy idea as an undergraduate at a tribal college to do, um, uh, 
do an intertribal workshop. And so I talked with this Southern Climate Impact Planning Program uh, leadership in Norman, Oklahoma at the National Weather Center and the National Weather Center. And I convinced them to put on a conference or a meeting that if they put the meeting on and hosted it, I would get tribes there. So I was able to get 22 out of 39 tribes to participate in this intertribal meeting on climate variability and change. Um, so that got me that got me not only recruited to the University of Oklahoma to do it again for the South Central Climate Science Center's regions and their tribes, but it also got me cited in the National Climate Assessment. And so moving forward into my next research, um, I uh, interviewed tribes about climate and I asked them, what does climate change mean to you? Are you, you or your tribe doing anything about it? If so, what, if not, why not? Basic questions. And, um, had this incredibly rich dialogue with uh, people from different different careers, different farmers, fishermen, uh, teachers, uh, all kinds of different professions came together from different tribes to talk about weather and climate. Um, I had a white male professor tell me the Indians didn't know the difference between weather and climate. And so my I set out to, to prove that wrong. Um, but anyways, we brought together all these different people from different disciplines, different cultures, different backgrounds, different understandings of, of science and knowledge and education levels, um, had professional scientists, you know, from Chickasaw Nation that that, you know, when asked what does climate mean to you, they're like, oh, precipitation and temperature, you know, the basic, you know, generic answer. Whereas some of the, the farmers and some of the medicine people had this incredibly detailed description of plants and animals, invasive species, uh, weather pattern shifts, and all of these, you know, really rich conversations. So um, during that same process, I, I met this, met uh, Heather Lazarus and, um, got to meet Julie Maldonado and many other people. And they started this program called Rising Voices, which was similar to what I was already part of with Haskell, which was the Indigenous Peoples Climate Change Working Group. Um, and Rising Voices became a place where people from different cultures, native cultures, different disciplines, different scientific levels, different education levels, all came together to talk about, you know, the challenges that climate creates and the different ways that people are responding to it, the different sectors that people have interest in. So we had community members, we had teenagers, we had um, scientists that were modelers and scientists that were social scientists and geographers and all of these people come together and, and having these incredibly rich conversations about climate and, and so on and so forth. So um, as I went through my PhD program, I applied to be a UCAR fellow and um, uh, was awarded the Diversity, Equity, Inclusion Fellowship, the same one Diamond was in later on, uh, the year after me. Um, and it just grew this this pattern of doing science from a multicultural, multidisciplinary, multi-education um, level, multi-gendered um, place of doing, um, of talking about climate, talking about weather extremes and variability, talking about disaster and risk, and um, working with communities to help develop their plans of adaptation and response. So um, that relationship with Rising Voices over many years um, culminated in the uh, application of a grant for Coasts and People um, through NSF. And um, Haskell Indian Nations was the lead PI and Dr. Wildcat. Um, and I'm one of the co-PIs and there's several others. And we put together this, this grand idea of, of doing convergent science, working with communities in one of four hub sites, Alaska, Hawaii, Puerto Rico, or, or um, Louisiana. And uh, talking with the indigenous communities or the native communities in those spaces about how the coasts are changing, about how fishing and farming and um, subsistence living was being affected by weather extremes and variability and climate shifts. Um, and so we're in the middle of this ginormous $20 million five-year project, um, or just at the beginning of it, I should say. And we have brought together, like I said, uh, probably 88 different people from different disciplines, everything from archaeology, anthropology, uh, so all the social, you know, a few social sciences, uh, geographers, indigenous geographers, both physical and human geographers, and um, modelers from 
uh, CI specialists. And I mean, I just can't even name off all the amazing disciplines that have come together and are trying to work, you know, together and develop language that is consistent, you know, because each of us bring our own languages from our own disciplines, our own <laughs> keywords, our own um, uh, specialties. Uh, and we're trying to communicate across across all of these differences and build um and build something that is con is is consistent which which is a challenge so i'm gonna just admit that it's a little messy it's <laughs> and it sometimes can feel very overwhelming because you're there's so many pieces moving um but we're we're doing it. We're working towards. I'm not, I'm not going to talk a whole much a whole bunch long a whole lot longer because um, I want to get to the other speakers and all. But um, it's possible. It's happening. We're doing it. Um, one to me, one of the important components for for my work is that we're working across cultures. We're not just working across disciplines. We're working across very different cultures, very place based place specific cultures who have unique challenges. And so we're going to be able to compare and contrast these different places that all have coastline. You know, what are the things that are similar they have? What are the problems that are different? How can solutions in one area possibly be a solution to another area or, or um, a problem be a problem in another area? Um, so all of these people have come together to try to develop a new framework, to develop a new and consistent way of, of doing science, including indigenous science as a legitimate science instead of a token um, uh, tokenized or um, what do they call it? A, um, anecdotal knowledge. You know, indigenous knowledge is deep, it's place-based, it's, it's generational, it's, it's communicated in different ways in different communities. Like uh, one of my favorite stories that I love to talk about is how I learned how Hawaiians talk about the Hawaiian cycle, or one of the ways that they've talked about the Hawaiian cycle, the, the hydrology, the water cycle in their culture, in their community is um, very much in, in, uh, in a chant, a hula. And the process is, is communicated beautifully and effortlessly and passed on through generations through these songs and these dances. Well, many indigenous communities have had, if not still have, some of those those knowledges and those methods and those um, ways of knowing, doing, and being. So it's really exciting to work not only across the disciplines, but across cultures. So that is something that I think um, you need to keep in mind as you move forward with um, your interest in convergent sciences is rec creating space for other ways of knowing, doing, and being, and not trying to deconstruct it with comparing it to Western systems of knowledge and, and uh, methods and methodologies, but to recognize that that is Western, the the mainstream system that we are dependent on is just one way and that if we create space and, and respect and be responsible to um, the science and accountable to be reciprocal with the communities we're working with you know we're not just taking from them to be um, to recognize the relatedness peoples have indigenous peoples have with place they they identify their bodies being of the soil of the water of the sky you know the air um, that there's that physical interconnection with place um, of relatedness that the work has to be relevant to them in their communities um, that the uh, there's a relationship that has to be built and maintained over time. So, um, you know, you're not just dropping in, taking and then never coming back, but you're building relationships over time and maintaining those. And that um, the redistribution of the information, how are we giving back to the communities are just seven basic R's that I've used in my research to work across disciplines, across cultures. So with that, I will say thank you. And I look forward to questions. Thank you so much, Paulette, for uh, talking about your career path in uh, relation with convergent science and also bringing up the fact that cross-culture uh, is also important when talking with convergent science. And I think now we have one speaker left, and that's David John Gagne. Uh, if you could introduce yourself and also talk about your background in relation with convergent science, that would be great. Welcome, John. Uh, thank you for the introduction uh, today. Uh, I'm, let's see if I'm trying to 
Which one? <laughs> uh, uh, I will aim yeah. just to write it through. <laughs> what the difference here? Uh, so, uh, um, currently, I'm a kind of a machine learning scientist at NCAR, uh, but getting to this point was a very long and, and somewhat twisted road that, that I've kind of. I think there were a lot of seeds of convergence along the way that that kind that kind of eventually blossomed into like all of these big projects like AI2ES. Uh, it's because I can kind of trace it back to about 2007. I was a freshman at the University of Oklahoma and got um, initially rejected from the. There's a research experience for undergraduate site at at the National Weather Center there, uh, and. And I, I didn't get into, I applied for, but I didn't get into that program, but then got instead selected for a, a another REU being held kind of in conjunction with it uh, by a relatively new uh, CS professor at OU named uh, uh, Dr. Amy McGovern. Um, it was like, hey, do you want to do some machine learning on this these simulations of s supercell storms I have? And I was like, okay, I don't know anything about machine learning or AI or uh, at that point, but it was, it was kind of game to try it. I, like, I'd grown up being really, really interested in weather and interested in computers, so it seemed like a good combination of things to, to try out. Um, so I spent this, uh, the, I think one of the, the cool things about the program, because I, even with this REU, I basically was still embedded with the other Weather Center REU people. And for those who aren't familiar with the National Weather Center, like Paula mentioned it in her uh, talk, the, the underlying idea behind it was, was that, was in some ways to foster what we are now calling convergence. Uh, originally, all the weather, the government and the academic weather people were in different parts of Norman, Oklahoma. So, like all the NOAA people were on the north side of town, and all the all the OU school meteorology people were were on, were on campus. And so, they got this idea to build a, a single building where everyone can can be in the same building and closer together, so that they'd be more likely to actually bump into each other and come up with new projects and work, work things out together. Uh, and so this was like just opened in like kind of the year before and people were kind of pouring into the building and getting settled. So, so I got, got the, I think some of the key, like some of the seeds there were one, there, there were a number of people doing machine learning weather at kind of the forefront of that, uh, like Amy as well as uh, Valley Appalachmanon and um, at the time like Mike Richmond and uh, so there's actually there's like a core of of, of, of AI weather people uh, uh, there. There's also kind of a burgeoning social science development because I think I think Eve Eve was at OU at the time uh, and I know there was like I've heard about was is uh, like through originally through the REU and there's some talk about social science. Uh, and and just like in the, as part of the REU, in addition to kind of doing my project on like storm classification, uh, I also got to spend some time like in working with like talking with a lot of the like weather forecasters and researchers, and uh, they were very happy to share their stories and and kind of answer lots of questions, kind of like these kinds of roundtables, and so I got to give lots of advice and and pick their brains and kind of could be some ideas of all these different pathways of thing things to do and where how to intersect stuff. Uh, I continue doing uh, kind of some uh, like research with with, with Amy, uh, like pretty much since that point, uh, it, it, uh, but but kind of in in, in different capacities and, and and a lot of the projects were kind of we had like initially sort of, sort of a, a few like meteorologist team members as well as like he was more on the computer science side and I was taking meteorology classes and computer science classes and kind of building this first intersection of like kind of meteorology and computer science uh, uh, sort of these dual like trying to build depth in both of them to to be able to kind of tackle this joint problem of, of like how do you get make an AI do a weather forecast uh, and then I, I had the opportunity to stay at OU for, for graduate school. Uh, and I guess also during my undergrad, one of the other things I, I did that I think planted a lot of the seeds was, was attending the AMS, the American Meteorological Society annual meeting and meeting the, the members of the, the AMS AI committee who were kind of coming from a number of different sectors. Uh, the, the, the 
conference at the time was really tiny. There's only a few people. So there's a lot of opportunity to talk with like kind of these all these different experts in, in, in different areas. And a lot of them were working like not just on AI for the sake of AI, but they were working with like AI for aircraft turbulence or renewable energy or uh, like, like kind of starting to embed themselves in other stakeholder groups and trying to understand like the ones that did have some make some inroads and success were ones that actually understood the needs of their like the partners they were working with and tailored their AI systems to 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 what, what like the data and the problems that that, that were being faced uh, and and kind of through this I, I like it start started and kind of still have a kind of core in severe storms but but through some happenstance I was basically asked to participate in a AI renewable or wind energy forecasting contest and and then like wanted on kind of like like having not put too much effort in it. But then there was a company there that was like, hey, we, we need your help doing machine learning for wind forecasting. So then I got kind of this con like consulting gig with a a company in in uh, Albany, New York, called Mezzo Incorporated, uh, that we're like we want to use more more modern machine learning in our in our uh, web tooling. So, uh, like flew up there, had an interview, and then kind of worked remotely for them for for a few years off and on, and basically talked to them about decision trees and random forests, and like th I think these methods could work well for your your, your forecasting needs. Uh, and through talking to them, I also kind of understood their needs and. Uh, it was also around this time I, I through the AI committee, I had gotten to know Sue Ellen Hopped, uh, who, who's uh, current, I guess, going to be stepping down as associate director of RAL, but, but had, had was at Penn State and then moved to NCAR to to work in RAL and had developed it like a big wind energy project with Excel Energy to um, basically improve their wind forecast so that they could reduce the amount of reserves they needed for their, their power. Um, and, and like as part of, as part of that pro like like eventually I was able to visit in car in like 2014 and and got to be involved in some of the like meetings that 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 Sue would organize between like the power companies and the the NCAR researchers on like wind and solar forecasting and kind of the needs of the utilities versus the like what we can do on this like on the science side so so this was really helpful and 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 um, what like it, making sure like the problem we're trying to solve is the problem that they need us to solve rather than like what's convenient uh and sometimes there's a lot of inconvenient aspects so like a lot of power data is is very proprietary and hidden behind ndas and other stuff so so you have you you really have you can't just like go out and grab data off the internet you have to you, you really have to go work with work with these companies and, and find the way to build trust and relationships with them um, and I got to spend a year at NCAR through the ASP Graduate Visitor Program working on kind of solar energy, but also some uh, so working on some severe weather stuff as part of my dissertation. Um, I think around the time I also met Julie and Rebecca, I think it was originally at the SLS conference in 2014, uh, that they were giving some uh, I think posters on I think some of the Twitter work y'all were doing uh, and, and with found it really fascinating uh and also i i also know through you i knew kim cloco uh, like while well, she was still like a phd student and doing her initial research on like the april 27th 2011 tornado outbreak uh, mm -hmm. uh and, and so kind of like i understand uh, like kind of through her and and through some of the was's group like like kind of being adjacent to some of those conversations mm -hmm. understanding just kind of the need for better communication of forecasts and how how much value it like we like you can't just make a more accurate forecast it needs to be able to get to the public uh in, in a way that they can make use of it and make and hopefully make better decisions and work through all of, like the the barriers along the way and i was also seeing kind of similar problems in the ai side so i built a cool ai algorithm and show like oh I have this great verification score but then what do you do with that uh uh like forecast like there are, uh, meteorologists are still really skeptical like how how's this actually going to be useful uh, so I was able to, like, in the process of developing some of the, like, hail machine learning algorithms, I, I got to be involved with the NOAA Hazardous Weather Testbed, kind of informally. I think I, I was at in the, 
I think it was like the OU party at AMS and happened to talk to Jimmy Korea, uh, who's like, Hey, yeah, I heard you're doing cool work. You should, you, you, you should, uh, reach out about being in the test bed. And then, um, I reached out and kind of was in, not like formally in there, but basically got to hang out and, and run my algorithm, occasionally show it on the, on the monitor and get some feedback from people. Um, and, and, and that sort of led to, to kind of understanding some of the needs of operations and talking to like SPC forecasters and weather service forecasters and tailoring like what I was showing, not just to, to like not show every single thing that could come out of the machine learning model, but sort of tailoring it towards what kind of products that, that they're like, look like what, what they're already using uh, so they can have a better comparison and gain the context of or what we described now from AI2S is like the extra contextual information they need to make, uh, like build their own conceptual model of the forecast. Um, then, yeah, I guess I finished my PhD at a number of opportunities, uh, then decided to come to I got an ASP postdoc in, in CAR. And my, my in-car appointment was interesting because like usually when you get an ASP, you're like you're based in a, like a single lab and that's your kind of home. I was able to finagle a, a uh, this is through another uh, kind of thing I haven't talked about as much, but, but the, I was involved with the climate informatics workshop, which was a kind of small conference held at NCAR on like climate and machine learning and AI and statistics all trying to come together and, and, and like build its own convergent community. Um, I had gotten to know Doug Nitschka through that as well as I already knew Sue. And so I proposed a joint postdoc where I'd be between Rao and Sizzle and, and kind of work on deep learning and solar energy and looking at some uncertainties and how we can kind of plug all these things together. Uh, my initial path and that didn't go the way I expected. So I went back to Hale, but then was able to look at interpretable deep learning and, uh, put together some of the pieces that to, to make something that works pretty well and, and get some a couple of interesting papers out that were sort of the foundations for some of the proposals for like AI2ES and a, a number of other like NOAA projects that came out, out of that. Uh, and during my postdoc at NCAR, I got to like meet a lot more people uh, in both the, not only in like, like in the RAL community and in the Sizzle community, including like some of the statisticians that work there and, and got involved with like, there's a, there's a, there was a math institute called SAMC in North Carolina that sponsored like a year of climate and AI and statistics. Um, so I, I did, I worked with some stochastic parameterization experts, including another postdoc at, at, at NCAR, Hannah Christensen, uh, uh, to, uh, basically try out a, a machine learning stochastic parameterization uh, and, and kind of work through all the, the challenges of that, but also learning kind of the language of the stochastics community and the, the statistics community and the applied math community and kind of getting a sense of, like, everyone calls things different stuff. So, so that was a, uh, like, kind of enriched my you know, experience and, and kind of learning about some other issues in terms of integrating, like, AI into, like, a client, into a client model, but, but also including stochastic stuff into AI, which is usually run more deterministically. Um, and all that then had an opportunity at, at where, where as my postdoc was ending, I was offered a, a like basically uh, my person would be my boss at uh, like, I guess Sue and Rich Loft end up put, putting together a position for me as a, this new machine learning scientist. So like kind of coming up with a new classification to, to emphasize some of the machine learning components because they recognize that this is an important area we need to invest in it. Um, and this was kind of the start of where AI, like people recognizing that deep learning was kind of a big thing and that we, we, we need to pay attention to it. Uh, so I was able to stay here and, and kind of uh, start filling out a group that, that where we were essentially trying to reach across NCAR and build different connections to different labs and got some seed money from the directorate to, to kind of start some of these projects on like parameterization in particular. Uh, and and we've been able to kind of, and those projects have sort of evolved into lots of different, some that are continuing in different forms under different funding streams, but have, like enable me to kind of embed in a lot of different communities, uh, including now with the kind of social science community through AI2ES. And uh, also have a couple slides, on, uh, it's kind of a long journey, uh, but I did have a couple slides. Sorry to interrupt you, David John. Would it be possible to go back to the slides during the roundtable if the questions come up? 
Yeah, I think I think that'd be fine. Um, I'm sorry to stop you. We, it's an yeah, exciting know, conversation, and we're realizing we didn't give it enough time. We should have had a two-hour session because it's so <laughs> enjoyable. You all come from such different backgrounds and have so, such interesting experiences. We, yeah, I'd be happy to, to kind of jump into the question. Yeah, whenever you uh, get to a point to answer a question that you know you it's on the slide, let us know, and we will share that slide. Okay. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. So I'm going to hand it over to Mariana, Diamond, and Shima to uh, uh, moderate the roundtable. Uh, Mariana? Yeah, thank you. So first, I want to say that we have some prepared questions, but if anyone from the audience has questions they want to ask as well, they're more than welcome to, and you can also add them to the Slido link. So we've heard from a broad range of background, both in what you do, where you do it, and how you do it. So I was wondering across the three speakers if you could talk about how it is that you go about writing or more ideating in a collaborative space when you might have different ideas or different perspectives than the other people that you're working with. And I'll open it up to whoever wants to talk first. Mariana, one clarification question. Do you mean this mm -hmm. writing and ideating when you're writing a proposal? Is that what you're, that's what I you mean? I think, yeah. So right. when it comes okay. to the proposal aspect, yeah. Got it. <laughs> I guess I can, go for it. I can talk a little bit. Um, so, so one of the big, I think AI2ES was probably the, the biggest experience in terms of trying to ideate a collaborative proposal with bringing together a lot of different, uh, bodies and i think some of the key parts of it was like going into it we are there's already a group of us that had known each other for quite a while um so so we, so we already had kind of a working relation and like informal working relationship built up so that that sort of helped that we understood our language but then there's still a lot of people that were kind of newer to the to the process but, but to like help integrate them i think some of the key parts were like like actually getting everyone in the room together like we we literally like rented a room at the at the Denver airport, like the the, the hotel. Um, this was right before COVID, <laughs> uh, and 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 like kind of hand worded out every day, like presented each of our, our different like backgrounds and what we can contribute, uh, and then kind of I think initially just sort of like a big exp exploratory period where you have to kind of get everyone's ideas out there and then be respectful and kind of like in the improv world, sort of yes and as much <laughs> as you can initially uh, to, to like build, build on all these pieces. Uh, so that's like kind of the ideation phase. So, so get all the ideas out there, kind of explain them, find, a, find that language and figure out where like, there's a lot of points where there's a lot of common terms that mean different things to different people. So, so making sure you're clear in your definitions of those terms is, is really important. Uh, then there's the ruthless cutting of ideas to get into that proposal limit. Uh, and and that's that's the kind of where where like some of the weaker ideas may you have to like be willing to not be too in love with a single idea and kind of be willing to like kind of give and take and and figure out like it'd be cool to do this but we don't have the time or scope but maybe we can do it in this in this form and then also making sure you like if you want to be a, have a serious commitment to like social science and make bring in extra people like originally we brought in Julie and Julie was like oh we like I'm not enough expertise on this. We need to bring in this other Anne who we who didn't really know, but like was game for it. So so we uh, 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 brought her in as well, and and like made some amazing contributions to to the proposal. That if we hadn't had them at the table, yeah, I, I don't think it would necessarily would have gotten funded because I think like the social science aspect has been one of the kind of key like like I think keys to bring the whole thing together. Uh, so, so the like kind of being respectful and being open to to kind of changing course and get, giving and taking. Thank you, Paula or Julie. Paula, you want to chime in and then go last? Sure, sure. Um, that's a that's a really good component is being fluid, being able to adapt to be able to let go of something you might be clinging to to create space for other ideas um, especially ones that maybe are outside of your comfort zone um, for us also in our project it was um, we were fortunate to be um, working with 
community members from different indigenous communities for a period of time who had their own ideas of what they wanted or what their interests were for research in their region. And um, that was for us a key component is listening and implementing what the community wants, um, which you don't often get because often, you know, projects are created without the community engaged in the beginning in the planning process and that's something that is is critical when working with indigenous communities is recognizing not only the sovereignty of these sovereign these independent communities um both politically and socially but the um the engagement on the planning level on the in the very beginning and coming from where you know they are and what their needs were and listening to them and you know kind of setting all of our preconceived ideas and and plans aside to hear what their needs were to try to plan around that um so uh for working with you know indigenous communities specifically um it's really important that when you're planning something um expect it to take more time and which equates to extra money um and beings that there's a certain amount of reciprocity expected um, and you're dealing with a nation to nation relationship. Um, it's really it's important to understand how best to work with any community, but being extra sensitive to the political status and the sovereign st status of um, indigenous communities. Uh, and I think that if that kind of respect can be managed across to any community, I think the project can only benefit. Um, and I'll just I'll just leave that at that point so that um, next speaker can go ahead. Yeah, I think one thing I want to emphasize that I think Paulette and DJ have both said is time. Like you need the time to plan to do this. Um, because it does take a while for the ideas to come together in some coherent way. And it's also, you know, frankly, a microcosm of what working on the research is going to be like, because it takes time and a lot of interaction. And if you don't invest in that so that it will actually come together in a coherent way, the reviewers will see it. Or I have been involved in proposals where my work was maybe more tacked on. And I thought, well, maybe eventually during the research, we could figure out a way to connect. But that was also an indicator of what the research was going to be like. So we didn't, you know, it didn't really achieve some of what I thought had a lot of potential to be achieved. Um, so I think time is a key component. I think I've got a lot of different, I, I, one thing I forgot to mention is that I'm a project scientist. So I write a lot of proposals <laughs> I and mean, I've got a lot of experiences in a lot of different ways where I've either been a co-PI or a PI. And I think, I think AI2ES was a different experience in the sense that we were all kind of, I think we did come together and have some ideas, but we were all like actively writing. I don't know how, how Amy managed that, but like there were like 20 people in the document writing, which, and it came together well, <laughs> that if I were leading it would not have worked for me. <laughs> so I think it's helpful to know what does work for you. Um, I think it was really interesting to be part of that and see how it is though. Like, I think again, it's a it's an indicator of the fact that the whole team works together so well in this very like non-linear but dynamic and very like generative way. For proposals that I have led, I think I've been more of the person who's led most of the writing. I will like ask other people to contribute parts that I just don't feel like I can fully represent. But I kind of, after doing a lot of the talking with everyone, have the ideas in my mind and feel like it's on me to pull things together in a, in a way that is really coherent. So I don't think it just looks one way for every single project. Um, but you know, those, I haven't done a $20 million grant. So I think if I were like COPE and AI2ES, I think are really different kind of scales. And I think if I were to lead something like that, I don't know that I could be the one to like write all of the, like be the one who manages most of it. I think you do need a lot more people who are contributing their expertise um, than just the, you know, the ways that I've done this in the past. So I don't know if that kind of starts to answer questions or if there's follow-up questions kind of about that process. But I do think time and getting together in the room, talking through these ideas and knowing that, I think this is the other thing that when you're writing things at the proposal phase, you, this is true for any proposal. It's not just conversions. Like you have enough of what you wanna do, enough of the ideas in terms of what are the interesting research questions and how you're gonna do it. But you don't really know what it's gonna look like until you start doing it, right? Like I just think this is how we do science. So yeah, Chris. I have a follow up. One of my questions is like when you're writing the proposals, how do you walk the line about being 
like concrete enough so that people are like this is a good investment versus like we will converge like we want to have space to work on stuff together you know so like showing enough detail without structuring yourself into like different silos in some ways like how can you come together and like you have mm. maybe a couple months and like this is how we're going to all meld together and you're like well how will you meld together how do you know that will work you mean like so how do you convince people of like the right yeah kind of balance there of giving yourself the freedom but also like being convincing i mean sometimes it doesn't happen mm -hmm. uh like like, like was, i've been in i mean i probably could have, like well i could point to some successes i've also had a lot of failures along the way <laughs> yeah uh we're, we're getting about failures for yeah sure. were, were you like it like as like Julie mentioned times is tacked on or or basically the the way the research is planned out is basically these two parts working in parallel and never actually converging i've been on a few projects like that i still have gotten good work out of it but but basically i kind of you know feel like I and mean, when you feel tacked on, it's hard. To, it's hard to engage more deeply. And, and at a certain point, you just kind of you're like along for the ride, and you, you do you just kind of make it through. Um, and, and and what happens happens. But I, I think when when it has like tried to convert some of, some of it, I think does require someone to have a, a stronger vision to like push people toward a certain direction. And Amy is certainly good at that. Uh, uh, like like she even there, there was like one institution that like wasn't really contributing a whole lot and she just like straight up cut them <laughs> and then like the this our site visit reviews so there the the, the NSF program managers had had some questions about like are you going to be a strong enough force to do this and she and she was like she then she explained I, I had this one institution that wasn't contributing and I just cut them and and but like yeah it, it, kind of that, that you so you can make the tough decisions on that and and that someone has to have a final call to to i think move it forward there's also just a lot of conversation about yeah how do you like how do you come up with a conceptual structure that that actually ensures things are talking to each other and mm -hmm. like in our if i go to the slides uh i think a good example of this is our ai2es diagram um that has that it sort of has this um all right, I guess I could share. Um, Just get it. And when we were originally trying to to workshop this diagram with the kind of the three circles, originally we uh, there's like kind of these various line kind of one goes like after the other, and we realized like that like like there's not that that isn't necessarily how it's, how how it should work is that then applies like some kind of pipeline, and then we don't actually like iterate at all, and so we kind of converged on the circle diagram uh that, that like each part kind of feeds into each other and, and kind of this uh uh, it, uh virtuous cycle i think was the the the, the, the terminology that, that came out of it and, and i think it it's mostly come to fruition as it, not every connection ha, 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 has worked out but but i think like building it into the underlying structure of your proposal that that there should be some iteration cycle that there should feed things should feed into each other at at certain points, um, I think it's pretty key. Um, Paulette, you have anything you want to add? Otherwise, then I, then I can jump in. No, go ahead, please. I think. Um, well, there's like five things I want to say. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to prioritize them. I think this is an important um, clarification that you can do convergent science. I feel really strongly about this. This is why I often say that, you know, many of us have been doing convergent research before convergent research was really called this particular thing. And so you can propose to grants that aren't just specifically calling for convergent science, re convergent science research, right? But you believe that this is how you're gonna address some of those questions. But then there are calls to do more convergent science stuff in particular from NSF. So I think kind of more directly to answer your question, Chris, sometimes it depends like how strongly you emphasize that depending on what you're proposing to. So like if I were proposing to something like the JTTI, like I did, it wasn't really a thing I felt like I needed to come through that much because they didn't care about it, right? So I just wanted to say that, but it's also a frame that I had for how we were going to achieve, answer, address these research questions. But I think kind of to your question about how to make sure you're not too stovepiped. So I think doing things like this is part of it, but I think it's also reflected in the kinds of research questions you frame in the proposal, right? I think a reviewer, and I've been reviewers for a lot of these proposals, you can tell if they're not really 
likely to get to true convergence based on how they're even approaching okay. what they're trying to do, if that makes sense. I think the one other thing I'll quickly add to this kind of jumping around in terms of um, kind of what it looks like is I think it really matters if you have a PI who truly cares about and believes in this stuff. They set the tone. Like that's what I think like Amy has done so well on other projects that hopefully the ones that I've led or that other people have led, like they're really gonna fight hard to actually bring everybody to the table, to value their perspectives. We talk about this in our paper. It's not that everybody has to necessarily have equal contributions, but their value needs to be equal, right? It depends on kind of, you know, how you structure the proposal. And I think that tone is, we, I can't overemphasize this enough that if the PI believes in it, then they will help everybody else, even people who maybe aren't entirely sure about some of this, like, what is this whole, why, why, are, why do we have social scientists involved, right? Some of those people can come along if you actually have a PI who cares about it. Yeah, I have one other thing I wanna make sure I have a chance to say at some point, but Paula, I would love to make sure you have an opportunity to answer the question. I'm good, no, you guys have done done great. I mean, like I said, it's, it's, it has to do with diversifying your community, diversifying your uh, ideas, um, and um creating space for everybody like you said that that the the equity um and justice will come out if the the um project is nurtured that way from the through the whole entire thing you know you can't just drop it in in, in certain spots and say okay we've done it it's 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 going to be great but it has to be somehow woven through the entire project so yeah that's it yeah thank I, you thank and i will pass it over to diamond yeah, I think um, this is a great conversation. And I think I, as an indigenous scientist, I think I wanna um, bring a little bit more of that part of convergence into this conversation. And I know like Paulette and I have a lot to say about this, um, but you know, as, as I've been working in this like climate change realm now, um, I've heard a lot about um, this term nature-based solutions. Um, and as an indigenous scientist, I don't really know how I feel about that term because to me, nature-based solutions is just indigenous ways of knowing and being. Um, and so I, I kind of wanted to hear um, all of your thoughts on how maybe we might be able to reframe the way we discuss uh, nature-based solutions, you know, as we engage with communities, as we engage amongst ourselves in, in our scientific community, and as we think about these, these projects, these proposals, how can we reframe the way we talk about this that honors our ancestors and other relatives who came before us, who, who did this work and laid this foundation for what we call sustainability? Um, so yeah, I don't know if anyone wants to start, Paulette. I don't know. Sure, I'll jump in on that. Um, well, first and foremost, Western science likes to tokenize and, and, um, and silo uh, its ideas and thoughts into different specific disciplines and and everybody hoards their information because the uh, academic cannibalism is is a thing and and people will lift each other's ideas and and try to claim credit for other people's work it, it happens no matter how much we try to convince ourselves that you know this is the system is, is set a certain way um it the reality is is that western science co-ops other knowledges and claims it as its own and um indigenous knowledges are um how uh, lewis and clark survived it's how america learned how to survive in the new world was from indigenous knowledge um because when they first came over none of their science mattered because it didn't it didn't um, all their methods of farming fell apart in 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 the new world, and so um, when we talk about indigenous knowledge as this othered this othered thing, this um, almost this this taboo thing that you know somehow or another is blasphemous if you if you somehow or another believe in it, but it's just an the the redistribution of how that knowledge is transferred across generations and across cultures is different. It's it's um, got tens and tens of thousands of years of, of trial and error and survive survival and thriving of different indigenous communities. Um, to, to It doesn't take, it's not a far look to realize indigenous knowledge and indigenous science is, is real. 
Um, so first and foremost, Western science systems have to come to terms with its own hubris, I think, first and foremost, um, and kind of recognize that um, in, indigenous knowledge has very important things to offer. Um, it will supplement some of the holes in sciences in science because Western science likes to take things apart and look at it in its most minute form, where indigenous knowledge is a system science. It likes to look at how that how all of these things interact with one another and how each of those cycles or uh, systems interact with other systems. And so it's a very holistic system of looking at things. Um, so I think as the science culture is shifting, um, being on the front edge of that shift and being willing to let go of some of your preconceived theories and ideas that Eurocentric science has brought into the system that we depend on and put so much emphasis on, but recognize that there are um, other ways of knowing and doing things that can lend to the tools and technologies that Western science systems have and together build this like we talk about this convergent this convergent system that develop new frameworks and new systems and new methods and new ideas and new um, breaking down old barriers of assumptions and uh, preconceived ideas of what is acceptable by science and what is rejected um, is really important. So um, as we go forward, just remember that we can't be so stuck and so, so form-fitted in our idea of what is knowledge and what is accepted and what is um what is yeah what is accepted what is what is considered a truth and by who and you know um because science truly western science is not truly objective because everything about who it informs us of who we are and how we see the world and all the experiences we've we've grown up with and all the influences you know they will flavor our opinion of how things will be, how the question will be formed, how the analysis will be done, what discussion will come from it, and what the, you know, the the so what is. Um, and that can vary very differently between a Western science and an indigenous scientist. Um, so being willing to cross that, that bridge and let go of some of our own um, hubris of science um, and being more respectful and open and patient with understanding with recognizing our own misunderstanding of what we've been taught um, because science is a social construct, right? So we have to be conscientious of that. So I'll just stop there because I can get off on a tangent on, on indigenous science really easy. <laughs> <laughs> DJ and Julie, do you guys have anything you want to add? One thing I'll add is I'm learning. Um, I would, I'll be really honest, like your question, Diamond, I don't even know this term. It's new to me or kind of how it's coming into these conversations. So I've got nothing, but I'm really valuing hearing about it. Uh, I, I'm, I can't say I'm as, I really appreciate Paulette's answer and kind of explaining a lot of the, the, the details of it. I, my probably one thing to add is, is I certainly seen some of this like kind of it, 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 it was like a fundamental tension of this in like the broader machine learning community because there was a, a lot of people who I guess as you call kind of the Eurocentric science approach like want to just come into a, a community and like here's our big AI model that will solve your problem boom uh, and and it's like in a way actually like because of things like you know Facebook and social, other social media systems and how they essentially plug the same kinds of models that are trained in the United States on across the world, it, it, uh, not understanding various like other countries, cultures and languages. And uh, it, like it's caused a lot of social unrest uh, by, by like not monitoring the disinformation in different communities. Um, or, or thinking that they solved the problem because they, they solved the benchmark data set that someone created for them uh, when without actually engaging in that community uh, and, and in a lot of ways causing even more problems. A lot, a lot of like the failed AI experiments that have happened um, ha have been because of this lack of respect for whether it be indigenous or other populations uh, and, not, and not working with them. Uh, and. I want to try to be better with that and try to engage more clearly. There's a lot I can 
do to further improve that. Uh, and like my, my network is well, diverse and expertise is not as diverse in different cultures as I would like. Uh, and, and, and so that's definitely an area to, I think we need to can be, keep being aware of and, and work to work to improve on. So can I ask just maybe everybody else is better informed than I am. Is there a definition of what you mean by nature based solutions or how this term gets invoked? Yeah, I, so one one way that I've heard it used um, in Hawaii specifically is um, there's like a lot of pollution um, in the groundwater and ocean water um, through like um, just, you know, runoff and things like that. And um, shellfish, I think there's like a specific like oyster or clam or something that does a really good job of filtering um, this pollution. And uh, like for a lot of us indigenous people, like, our ancestors grew up harvesting and knowing that these species were important for the environment. Um, but now I've heard it used more as like, it's a nature-based way to resolve this, like this issue that we've created as humans. And in my head, I'm like, yeah, like my people knew that, like this isn't a new thing. Um, but uh, frequently uh, as I've, like when I was applying for my postdoc, I was looking specifically for positions that would allow me to work with indigenous communities. And a lot of the time I noticed that this term nature-based solutions was attached or within those job descriptions. Um, and so I felt like it, I could see where they were going, but it didn't quite honor the ancestors who um, are from those places. Sure, mm -hmm. that's interesting. But yeah, I, th I think this was like a perfect segue to uh, what Shima's question um, was going to be. So I'll hand it over to her. Absolutely, yeah. Thank you, everyone. It's so much fun to listen to the organic conversation that we have. So another interesting topic in this realm is community science, which is kind of like what we talked so far. Uh, and to put everyone on the same page, so it means like designing and conducting the research based on priority and needs of the community or a, a group of uh, target community, which is an important step to have a truly actionable science. Um, so what we wanted to discuss is that, do you think that we need a culture change in traditional and common way of science to be connected to the priorities of the communities? And if we need those changes, what are those in your mind, especially considering the lack of prior funding before mm -hmm. proposals? Yep. And what are your suggestions for early career scientists, how they can connect with communities and design their proposal um, to be more um, community oriented? Great question. Well, let's start with relevance. <laughs> Um, one of the seven R's I talk about, you know, relevance, you know, and, and that's the so what, you know, the so what is the work we're doing um, mean or matter to the community that it's supposed to uh, help. Um, and I think that um, some of this work comes from building relationships over time and relationships are built at the speed of trust. I've heard that so often from, from Bill Thomas and Dr. Wildcat and so many of my mentors that I look up to is, is, you know, relationships are built at the speed of trust and trust takes time and trust can be broken and trust is so delicate sometimes. And um, work, you know, if you're going to work with a community, you know, know your community, know what community you're going to work with, know, um, you know, and take the time to sit at the kitchen table and have coffee and tea. Um, be willing to spend time just being part of a community, contributing, um, reciprocity, you know, what are you giving to that community that makes them want to support giving something to you? Um, so, and then what is the responsibility you carry being a member or a contributor to that community? Um, are you being accountable with your research? Um, so, for me, you know, I work with indigenous communities because I come from one. So I, it's easy for me to um, to identify and connect with other indigenous communities because I too, you know, come from that space. Um, so if you're, you know, I think it really comes down to where you want to spend your career. 
because once you start those relationships, you really should nurture them over time. I have, I've got this incredible network that I've built over many, many years, starting with my, my undergraduate, you know, um, my uh, under, undergraduate and associates uh, programs where uh, I made, I became friends and extended relatives of different communities or different people of different families. And so when I, I'm tasked with doing a project. I've kind of got one foot in already um, because I'm already either part of that community or identify with that community. So, you know, coming from, you know, go, go with what you know, that that's helpful. Um, be fearless, be kind, be generous. Don't come empty handed, you know, don't show up expecting a community to give you something without somehow or another having something to reciprocate. I mean, I've I've gone out and helped farm, helped uh, pick weeds, helped uh, clean up the beach. You know, I've I've done given physical time and labor to reciprocate with a community to show them I'm invested, and I think that you know, find ways to invest in those communities um, because those networks will grow because word of mouth, you know, people will tell their, their, their peers and their community members and their relatives if you're, if you're a good one or not, you know, a good scientist or not, because, um, you know, especially with indigenous communities, we have a long torrid history with science and scientists. Um, but I think that, is, is a safe assumption if you're working with an urban community, uh, inner city, urban, um, or farmers in rural, you know, just having an understanding of their community, understanding some of their history, some of their politics, some of their, um, you know, uh, challenges, uh, just coming prepared. Educate yourself on, on them so that you can be respectful and be, you know, address the etiquettes and protocol of that place and in a proper, in a proper way, in a good way. DJ, you have any thoughts? Yeah, I, I agree with everything Paula had said in, in terms of like building your network and being, uh, I think, say, yeah, getting involved in the care work of the community and, and yeah, I've seen way too many machine learning people come in to, to like different, even like even coming into the weather and climate communities, be like, give me your data set, and I will hand you my wonderful algorithm that will solve all your problems, and inevitably it doesn't happen, or or they like they don't engage and leave, and uh, and, and that that's like yeah, it's unsuccessful. That helps diminish the reputation of like that we're trying to build, but like this is a a useful tool that we want to engage and integrate properly uh, and yeah like there's a there's a whole lot of different communities and even like in the science a little subset every different subfield of science is kind of its own community and it has its own uh like people who are the experts in history and, and stuff and and making sure to, to i think respect that as well as the yeah in, like indigenous communities and and, and, and different, you know, racial gender groups and like, there's a lot of different communities. And I think if you want to engage with one, you know, just, yeah, spending time with it is it, kind of the only way to, and building that, that those relationships of trust is the only way to, to really do it successfully. I think one other aspect I'll add it, it, is as you're going through your career and kind of going from being like a grad student or postdoc or very early career where you're kind of maybe a member of a team or, or working on your own to like building, maybe, maybe end up building your own group. Um, I think paying it forward and setting the culture of like mentoring your, your, your students and colleagues and other people who work in this area to, to kind of follow these practices, I think is also really key. Uh, and recognizing that if you yourself can't maybe spend as much time in with engaging with this community, making sure there is a point person who has been trained in this area and has like kind of your, you're like, like you, you've vetted well that to, to be kind of your focal point there or if you do want to build a bridge to a new community grow that person to be that bridge uh so so you make sure they, they still get get the time and attention they need i've certainly had some failures in that regard where i've kind of engaged with them like moved on to other projects or, or gotten signed off on too many things and then not been able to keep up that engagement with that community and thus lost that connection or 
in that trust and or, or there was the potential for something and it didn't it didn't it didn't uh play out uh successfully so it you, you can't be everywhere at once so it's kind of you have to prioritize but then uh, if it's important then, or if you like want to make that trade off there, there there can be other ways to still engage uh but but be but still maintaining that respect mm -hmm. I think those are great points what DJ just said. I think I'm gonna sound like a broken record, but this is something that's taken me a while to learn is continuing to build in the time when you're proposing something to do that kind of engagement and thinking about it longer term because it is so key. And what DJ just said was one of the challenges that I have also faced where even though I care so much about certain communities, especially as a project scientist and you're just trying to juggle this one and then move on to the next one and keep yourself funded, I felt like that reciprocity that I care so much about, maybe I haven't always been able to fully see that through. And again, for me, this comes back to continuing to learn how to truly budget how much time it's gonna take me to do this kind of work. All the pieces, all the hidden labor pieces that maybe you write into the proposal or maybe you don't, but you know that this is part of what you're, how you're gonna spend your time. You know, I think it's an interesting question to think about. I think um, funding agencies are increasingly starting to value if you explicitly say you're gonna spend time to do that stuff. But even if they don't, again, building it in. And then I would say for me, I mean, I, I completely, with everything, completely agree with everything that has been said. Um, I think the community that I work with most closely and have been able to start to bring more formally into the proposals is the National Weather Service, like really valuing them, their expertise. Um, I think, you know, I've been so appreciative that like Marianne and Chris have really, I think they have fallen in love with the forecasters, right? Like, and this is really important for me because they have tremendous expertise and knowledge and they have really difficult structures that they work within and they're often not valued compared to you know the the research scientists in the atmospheric science community and even they themselves will often be deferential even though you know they have more expertise than some of the people who are doing some of the development um and so i think kind of working when knowing what their structures are like one of the things that chris has done that i really value is like when he wants to interview them like making it available on a sunday or in the evening because that might be the best time that they can actually you know talk with you or i've worked an overnight shift with forecasters i've spent a lot of time in their wfos with them um just to kind of really understand that that landscape and have done this for 15 years right so it's not the kind of thing that you do one time i do think it's hard when you want to i think paulette what you said about like knowing who you want to work with early on is so key but then how do you start to like bridge into new areas and can you like work with other people who have kind of those trusted relationships i think is a good way of doing that so i think it's a great question really important awesome so we can go to last question with anna yeah i'll just shoot the last question and uh, it's really just to wrap up the entire session um so we are all here um, early career scientists. Most of us are or e either starting in these convergent science projects or either planning on starting that. So we would like to know in one word for each of you, what piece of advice would you give to us for kind of like start building these connections that are really important, like where to look and how to put together a group and start brainstorming if you have an idea, like an early career, where do you start? Like going to conferences or just like chatting with colleagues and how is that evolving? <laughs> um, I built my network um, through my peer cohort, through my community cohort, and I I built a lot of connections through going to conferences. If it wasn't the Indigenous Peoples Climate Change Working Group, it was AGU, AAG, AMS. Um, go, be don't silo yourself in in your disciplines conference. Definitely get outside of your disciplines conferences. Present at different conferences at different you know um, in different sessions. Learn, go to and check out other sessions at these different conferences, and meet the people that have work that ex inspires you or excites you or confuses you that you have questions reach out and talk to these people get cards email questions after the conference if there's no time to talk to somebody be be brave um and be patient um but definitely don't limit yourself to just your disciplines conference um yeah that's my 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 two cents 
can keep the lamp. Yeah. Um, DJ? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know I'm like handing off to DJ because I continue to think, but. Yeah, I, I want to second the getting, go to conferences that are outside your your kind of core domain. Uh, I've, I've attended all kinds of random stuff uh, from like, I, I went, like the last conference I went to before COVID was the catastrophe risk conference like run by the reinsurance companies. Uh, uh, and I've also been to like the cyclone workshop and the uh, kind of like statistics conferences and uh, the GPU technology conference is a particularly fun one because they have all kinds of like, everyone's using GPUs, but it's like Pixar and then Walmart and BMW and Japanese companies building robots that pick up clothes, like toys in the uh, room. <laughs> It's a very eclectic kind of mix of, of, of like, especially if you can target some of the like, like kind of some of those kinds of conferences where, uh, where where it is maybe a little bit more eclectic, and you might have some very unexpected combinations uh, in or places where you're like the one person of your expertise in the room. In addition to like building your community, kind of conferences where you are with your people, I think those are really important too. Uh, and like. One of my other strategies is, especially at a place like NCAR, is go have lunch with, go sit down at different tables that, especially now that we're back in the buildings again, like maybe you know one person at the table, but you don't know anyone else. That's a good way to, to like kind of have an in uh, on, on, on kind of making new connections. I mean, that's where the postdoc happy hours and stuff are useful and, and these kinds of Q&A sessions. Uh, I think Thompson Lecture Series is also really good for like inviting, like, people that are way outside your community, you, never, you know, uh, you never know kind of where these lead. And also keep in mind that some of these connections aren't like next day, you're going to be writing a, a giant research proposal with this convergent team. It's stuff that takes trust, like the speed of trust. I like the buying from Paulette. Uh, it can take years for, for, for some of these things to play out. But then when, when like, you know, the, everything, all the conditions come together, boom, you know, some, mm -hmm. uh, so, so yeah try to cultivate and see where things take you. There's a lot of kind of serendipity in this process. Um, so maybe a couple other things to add. I think, I think these kinds of fora are really helpful. I think if you are interested, I think those of us who do this work should always be willing to talk with you more. And I think a couple of things like we could, um, I would even be happy to share past proposals because I think there's a lot of knowledge here that's hard to externalize, right? Um, in terms of like even how you frame things or, you know, we tried to ex externalize some of that, but just some of it is just so hard to capture. And so being able to talk with people who've done this, I think if like knowing you're interested is, is helpful. And then I think, I do think it's valuable if you can also start being involved in other proposals that other people are leading. Like, I think it would be really hard for me to have just started off, even though maybe I was interested in this, I love DJ's seeds of convergence. I wouldn't have known what I was doing, right? Like, so it helped to work alongside people who were doing this for a while and then to learn the process. But I think the final thing I'll say, because this is such a big, important question, all these questions are big, important. Um, and I'll say this to everyone, is that NCAR is trying to stand up more coordinated convergent science initiative at the directorate level. And I'm going to be helping with that. And so part of this is, and will involve an implementation plan to like help facilitate this work at NCAR better and including leveraging the existing amazing stuff that's going on. And so I would love to maybe have another conversation about these kinds of things to think about. I mean, this will slowly be ramping up over the next couple of months and be announced, but I think for all of you to think about what are additional ways that we can support you and your interest in doing this kind of stuff would be really helpful to hear about. Well, that's great. Yeah. So I think that we're on time. I think that Mariana is going to, yeah, <laughs> is going to wrap up this session. Well, this session, the entire seminar series, it just, yeah, we at so, the end. <laughs> I think, thanks, Anna. First, thank you to all of our three speakers that we had today, Julie, Paula, and DJ. We really appreciate you spending the time and sharing uh, trials and tribulations, if you will. And we also appreciate you sharing your own unique perspectives on this. But on a greater level, I want to uh, thank everybody who's in attendance and past attendance that aren't here right now, but to just show you what it means when postdocs have an idea and they want to see it through. So we were able to put on a six part series. As you can see here, these are the great faces of those who from internal to 
NCAR and UCAR and also external to NCAR and UCAR who are able to help us better understand the grant writing proposal process. I don't think any of us are necessarily experts at this point, but we're able to have a little bit of our feet wet to go forward with. And the last thing I want to say is keep an eye on your email because we will be doing a post event poll to see how we can uh, better serve the postdoc needs within the community and also just ideas that you might have for other types of event events that you would like to see going forward. So with that, I'll close it with a physical round of applause and then also Google's new feature. You can give uh, virtual rounds of applause and hearts. So thank you to everyone. This was great. <laughs> oh, that's so nice. yeah. <laughs> Ariana, now I understand. Mine doesn't do this. <laughs> I think it, it, they just added it like this week. I know, but she's yeah. showing me, but when it will just like, it will do what it looks like Anastasia. Uh, I don't get the whole animated. And I was like, I don't know yeah. what you're talking about. She's like, <laughs> seeing this all over? I'm like, no. <laughs> Maurice, did you have a comment? I think someone raised their hand up. Oh, no. All right. Well, with that, we'll close it out. And again, thank you everyone so much. This was great to have everyone's participation in the discussion. Thank you so much. Okay. Have a good one. Thank you. Thank you.